In this video, I'll introduce the concepts of diversifiable and undiversifiable risk. I'll talk about the primary measure of undiversifiable risk, otherwise known as beta, and then I'll talk about how we can use portfolio betas. So let's get going. We can break risk down into two broad types or categories. The first type is diversifiable or firm specific risk. Firm specific risk is risk tied to a specific asset, like a firm's stock. The risk of the firm defaulting on its debt, the risk of the firm's CEO dying, or the risk of an E. coli outbreak at the firm are all firm specific risks. These risks primarily affect the stock of this firm. While they might affect firms up and down the firm's supply chain, this firm will be most heavily affected. When I say that we can reduce risk through diversification, this is the risk I'm talking about more or less eliminating. The other type of risk is undiversifiable or market or systematic risk. It has many names, uh, but those are its most popular names. Now this risk, this undiversifiable risk, is the risk, as the name implies, you can't diversify away. Every firm in the market is affected by this risk. No matter which stocks you hold, those stocks will always be affected by this risk. Some stocks will be affected a bit more, some stocks will be affected a bit less, but this risk does not go away. Because you as an investor can't eliminate this risk, you should demand some additional compensation for exposing yourself to this risk. Now, here's a graphical representation of the benefits of portfolio diversification. Notice that as we increase the number of securities in our portfolio, the portfolio risk decreases here. So I have standard deviation of our portfolio on the y-axis, number of securities in our portfolio on the x-axis. As we get down to about 20 or 25 different securities, you'll notice that the marginal benefit of an increase in the number of securities in our portfolio is pretty negligible. I mean, essentially, we've gotten down to eliminating, eliminating almost all of the possible diversifiable risk that we can, and what we're left with is primarily undiversifiable risk. Now, most mutual funds will hold at least 20 or 25 different securities. Uh, many mutual funds actually have a rule that specifies that they will hold no more than 5% of their assets in any one security. So you can imagine that many of those mutual funds will have between 30 and 50 or 60 different securities in their portfolio. So what this ends up, what ends up happening is most investment funds that diversify their portfolio are exposed to very little diversifiable risk. And so in the case of, let's say, a stock out or a bankruptcy of one of the firms in their portfolio, that mutual fund has very little exposure to that one security. I mean, that security might only represent 2% of their total assets under management. Now, what I'm trying to get at here is that when our portfolio is well diversified, we worry less about firm-specific risk and focus more on undiversifiable risk. You know, the risk that's left over once we've perfectly or near perfectly diversified our portfolio across a broad range of industries, markets, etc. The measure we use to calculate undiversifiable risk is called beta. And beta indicates how the securities returns respond to fluctuations in market returns. If a stock has a high beta, that means it's exposed to a high amount of undiversifiable, aka market, risk. Now, we're calculating a stock's beta by comparing its returns with those of the market. In the US, we define the market as the S&P 500 just because the S&P 500 represents about 85 to 90% of the total publicly traded market cap in the United States. The formula we use to calculate beta looks more or less like this. We'll regress the excess return on stock I on the excess return on the market, and the coefficient on the market will be our beta, just this thing right here. 
I'll discuss this formula in much greater detail later, but you might have already seen it before. This formula is our capital asset pricing model. It's one of the most important models in all of finance. Now, before I go any further, I want to reiterate why we care so much about beta when we're building a portfolio. It's because we're ideally going to be holding at least 25 or 30 different securities that each have correlation coefficients with each other of less than one. Because we have a diversified portfolio, we don't necessarily need to worry as much about firm-specific risk. Even if a firm-specific risk event occurred, like Chipotle suffering an E. coli outbreak, the weight of Chipotle in our portfolio is so small that the damage to our portfolio is going to be relatively minor. By diversifying our portfolio, we have significantly reduced our firm-specific risk. Since most of the risk in our portfolio is undiversifiable risk, we need to focus on that. Now let's talk a little more about beta, our primary measure of undiversifiable risk. Alright, so the first thing we need to know about beta is that beta tells us how the returns of an asset will change based on a change in the market. And when I say market here, just understand that I'm referring to the S&P 500 as our measure of the market. Now, what this means is that if the market is expected to offer a return of 10% over the next year, any stock with a beta of 1.5 is expected to increase or has a, have a return of around 15%, assuming that we have a very, very low risk-free rate. Now, the average beta in the market is 1%. I mean, the beta of the S&P 500 is just one. So it's, it's kind of the average beta across our entire marketplace is one. So any security that has a beta of greater than one is said to have more undiversifiable risk than the market as a whole. And any security that has a beta of less than one is said to have less undiversifiable risk than the market as a whole. So that's more or less what I'm indicating here. Betas of greater than one just indicate that the stock is more risky or exposed to more market risk or undiversifiable risk or systematic risk or whatever you want to call it. Unfortunately, in the real world, there are multiple names for this kind of risk and everybody has their own preferred name. I'm trying to keep it simple here by just saying undiversifiable versus diversifiable, uh, but I mean, market risk is a very common term for this kind of risk. All right, now, most stocks in the U.S. will have betas between zero and about two. Uh, there are, however, stocks with betas well in excess of two, and you can actually have stocks with betas of less than zero. That indicates that when the expected return on the S&P 500 is positive, that stock is expected to have a negative return, and vice versa. Now, the final thing I'll say here in this grab bag of important points about beta is that there are a lot of ways to look up beta. One of the ways that you can look up a company's beta and its historical beta is to use the beta function in Bloomberg. I mean, you can look at the beta of a, any company in Bloomberg through time, and it's a very handy function. All right, now let's take a look at some betas of popular companies at a specific point in time. So I'm choosing to look at the betas of these popular companies in October of 2019. And the reason I'm choosing to keep this data a little less than fresh is because COVID has kind of thrown off our betas for the next several quarters. Uh, essentially, stocks, when we talk about how beta is calculated in more detail, you'll see that there's been enough market disruption that some of these betas of these companies have been thrown out of whack from, really, their historical averages. All right, now, I'm going to use this to describe some characteristics of companies and the industries that they're in. So let's start off with GM and Ford. As of the time that I put together this data, GM had a beta of 1.25 and Ford had a beta of 0.97. Uh, historically, firms in the same industry will have fairly comparable betas. I mean, GM and Ford are exposed to the same risks in the auto, auto manufacturing industry. And auto manufacturing as a whole is 
fairly cyclical. So these are actually betas that are quite a bit lower than their historical average betas. I mean, GM and Ford will typically have betas of greater than one. It's just, you know, happenstance that they don't as of this point in time. Next, Apple and Google. Now, Apple and Google are tech companies, and historically tech companies like, let's say, Netflix or Amazon will have very high betas because their returns are extremely cyclical. Uh, but Apple and Google, they're very well diversified. I mean, they operate in just about every area of the tech sector, and they, I mean, they also sell data. I mean, Apple and Google are about as diversified as companies get, uh, short of maybe GE or Berkshire Hathaway. And so what we find is that those companies that are very well diversified, they'll typically have betas that are very close to the market beta of one. And so that's what we're seeing here. Next, airline companies. And airline companies like Southwest Airlines and American Airlines, because airlines are extremely cyclical or they're they're in a cyclical business that does really well in bull markets and very poorly during bear markets or recessions or especially periods in time where we have a massive worldwide pandemic, airlines will typically have a very high beta. They're exposed to a, a large amount of undiversifiable risk. Uh, so if there's some big risk event like a coronavirus hitting the world or let's say a financial crisis occurring, those stocks of those airlines are going to be hurt the most. Uh, in other words, airlines are the most sensitive stocks or some of the most sensitive stocks to the movements of the broader market. Next, we have some banks. And banks are pretty well diversified. I mean, most banks are typically going to have betas uh, pretty close to one. Uh, next, we have JCPenney. And as of the time that I'm recording this video, JCPenney has already entered bankruptcy, but one of the benefits of getting historical data on JCPenney is that I can show you what their beta looked like prior to bankruptcy. And JCPenney had an enormously high beta of 2.63. I mean, that's probably in the top 5 or 10% of all betas of publicly traded firms. Uh, so what this indicates is JCPenney is horribly, horribly exposed to market or undiversifiable risk. In other words, if there is a downturn in the market, say in 2020, JCPenney is going to be hurt far more than other firms with lower betas. Next, we have General Electric. And I know I've already mentioned this, but GE is a very well-diversified company. I mean, historically, it's been one of those companies that has been the most diversified or considered one of the most diversified. And so it should have a beta very close to one at all times. And then finally, we have gold, or in this case, it's a gold miners ETF. So this ETF actually has a negative beta. And of all the assets, all the securities that you should know something about, this is probably the most important because there's really only one asset out there that people recognize as having a consistently negative beta, and that's gold. Typically, when there's a financial crisis or there's concerns about inflation, people will flock to gold. I mean, I, I realize most of the people watching this video are younger, but right after the financial crisis of 2008, there was a massive run on gold. Uh, people like Glenn Beck, uh, they were actually trying to sell gold, uh, and the price of gold got pushed up very high. Uh, essentially, gold is viewed as almost like a reserve currency. It's, it's an asset that has always held value, and so when there's concerns about the value of the U.S. dollar, or there's concerns about inflation, or concerns about the health of the overall economy, the price of gold will tend to spike. And so that's what we normally see, uh, or that's why we normally see a negative beta with respect to anything in the gold or gold mining industry. Now, you might be wondering how we calculate the portfolio beta, and it's really simple. We just calculate or collect the beta of each security and multiply those betas by the weights of each security in the portfolio and then sum up those weights times betas. In other words, 
the way we calculate a portfolio beta is the way is very similar to the way we calculate a portfolio return. It's just a weighted average. All right, let's recap. Now, I started off this video by discussing diversifiable and undiversifiable risk. And I said that as we diversify our portfolio, we stop caring about that diversifiable risk or firm specific risk. And what we really have left or the, the majority of the risk that we have left is undiversifiable or market risk. And so we need some measure of undiversifiable or market risk. And that's where we focus on beta. Beta is our primary measure of undiversifiable risk. The larger the beta, the more undiversifiable risk the security exhibits. And then finally, I mentioned that our portfolio beta is just a weighted average beta of the securities in our portfolio. So with that, I'm going to end. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. All right. Thank you very much.